Hi, hey everyone. Uh, thanks for joining for the event today. Uh, today we are basically getting together, you know, some of us uh, Facebook alumni and for those, you know, founders themselves want to get together and talk about their journey and share some of the experience. And, you know, hopefully we all gain, you know, learn from each other and gain insights on what it is like to be a, you know, founder and entrepreneur, you know, in the future. I want to, you know, get started with, you know, quick intro around the table and like if you could, could if you guys could talk about, you know, yourself, you know, where, you know, where you were, where you were at Facebook, you know, what do you do now? And, you know, some of the quick blurbs about yourself. I have uh, Ruben right next to me on my screen. Ruben, you want to kick it off? Yes, of course. Um, so thanks, obviously, for having us. Um, I am um, the founder or one of the founders at Swoop. And at Swoop, what we're solving is that there's this huge industry of chauffeur transportation, which a lot of you are probably not familiar with. But effectively what it is, it is like buses, limousines, coaches, black cars, sedans, and SUVs. And these vehicles are owned by a lot of small mom and pop shops on the supply side. So it's usually they own two to three vehicles and they run their business on pen and paper. And what we do is that we build software for these uh, vehicle operators for these fleet operators and we empower them through our SaaS to do what they do best focus on running their business and we enable them through our software and then one of the additional problems that we realize is that they're unable to market themselves or to get net new demand so we also have a lead acquisition channel where we go out and we have partnerships with companies like Amazon or Walmart and if they need transportation they come to us so Amazon will come to us and say hey room I need 10 buses we don't own any vehicles. We just pass those leads onto the operators that are on our software. So now if you're a vehicle operator, not only do you get really, really cool software instead of pen and paper, but you also get net new business. And that's kind of the value that we give them. And in return, they pay us a subscription fee plus a commission on each lead that we source for them. We're 20 people now, which is crazy. We had a Zoom today with, with 20 people. I was like, this is crazy that there's so many people. I know it's not a lot, it's a lot for us. And um, we're mainly based out of Los Angeles. We have some engineers up in San Francisco and in Chicago, but we're mainly out here in LA. We raised our seed uh, fund or we raised our seed money um, earlier last year and now raising our series A later this year. At Facebook, I was a nobody. Um, and I, I see all of these intros in the Slack channel. I'm like, wow, fuck, this is crazy. But no, I was, I was working on like a growth uh, go-to market team um, for the workplace, uh, for the workplace team. Everyone here is familiar with workplace. We had just come out of beta at the time and it was super fun being on that team. Um, and then eventually decided to join, um, to join Swoop. The last thing I'll say is that I'm uh, half German, half Persian. That's why you hear the accent. Moved to the US a little bit more uh, recently, grew up there uh, partly as well. And yeah, really, really excited to chat with everyone here today. And to my right is Eris. So I'll have you go next. Oh, thank, thank you for that. Um, cool. I also wanted to thank the organizers. I remember the times when I was at Facebook and thinking about the startup and having something like this, I think would would have helped me. So really, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, for me, maybe I'll go the other way around. We'll start with background and get to what, what we do at Urban Leap. Um, uh, but yeah, also also not from the US. So I'm uh, Israeli. That's the accent that you're hearing. Um, my light just went off, but we're still on. So that's good. Um, I... So I studied back in Israel, uh, mathematics and computer science. Somehow I ended up doing an internship with Facebook and then coming full time. So that was eight years ago that I moved to the, to the Bay Area um, to start working at Facebook. Uh, back in Facebook, uh, I guess I guess I like Ruben, I felt like nobody, no, actually it was, it was a great experience. Uh, learned a lot working the ads measurement uh, team now it's a, 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 a all a pretty huge org i believe but back then it was just a team um yeah and along the way I met my co-founder he's a very convincing person that's why he's the ceo and and, and i'm not but he convinced uh, he got me excited about doing something together and we eventually uh, did and started working on urban leap uh, almost four years ago um what urban leap does after 
um, a good good number of iterations is uh, helping governments with their procurement process. So procurement process in government, if you're not familiar with it, that's a good thing because it's pretty pretty ugly. But this is how government spends. Ten percent of the economy is is how the government you know source anything from toilet paper, bridges, services, um, and this is a very very manual and worse than that ineffective uh, ineffective process. Um, and we help them. We are, I would say, I can confidently say we're the first kind of smart Pokemon platform. We're not the first, but we're the first smart one that helps them really do the process in a smarter way, use data, leverage some, you know, machine learning and this kind of uh, buzzwords to do the process much, much better. Um, and, and yeah, that's after our pivot we've been about, done about a year ago. Um, that's finally going really well. So four years on the road and, you know, sometimes it takes a few iterations. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. And again, excited to talk and answer questions and, and help with anything I, I can. And you're not right next to me, but I'll pass it over to Elliot. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so I'll do my intro kind of the same way. Uh, before Facebook, I've done a whole bunch of things, right? So everything from a tiny two person startup where IT was you took your credit card down to the Apple store uh, to an iPhone games company that got acquired, Microsoft open source B2B startup, Cloudera, and finally Facebook for seven and a half years. At Facebook, I ended up being um, on Ads Foundation, which is a like tech lead role in charge of ads. So I was the production engineer slash software engineer slash monkey that ran at anything that was on fire. Um, if it was on fire, I was supposed to run towards that rather than away. Um, and I, I did that and kind of saw what ML was and all of that. And I looked at my whole career and all of the stuff that I had built and kind of said, I'm building the same platform over and over and over again. And Facebook has the best version of it that I've tried, where production engineers are responsible for keeping everything below this good. And the product engineers can reach for a database or a cache or a whatever they want, and they don't have to worry about it. And so I wanted that when I was actually about to start up a different startup and then kind of had the idea that like, hey, everyone reaches and builds for the same platform, the same five or six things, and they grow it the same way because they're all having trouble with their technology stack. Uh, so I started Batteries Included a month ago or a month and a half ago now, that is a software company that provides a platform that does all of the stuff that a good infrastructure team would do. And we provide it in a software as a service. We pay, we get paid when you use it kind of thing. And then I guess, which direction? Zach. Yeah. <laughs> Well, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Zach, um, and I was at Facebook 2014 to 2016 as a PM on uh, actually speech recognition, uh, shipped their first work in speech recognition that now powers captions for newsfeed and some content understanding stuff. The early flavor of it, uh, since it was kind of a zero to one, was actually um, uh, transcriptions of voice clips that you sent in Messenger which ended up being a horrible idea for a lot of reasons, slows down the message send path, meant you need a larger file size to do speech recognition well on it, all this stuff. Um, but I uh, worked on that and ended up getting it as a thing that um, advertisers use to get more watch time on their videos. And then you can get engineers pretty quickly when you realize it's, it's linked to the ads uh, team or ads org. Um, worked on newsfeed. Uh, so the rendering with like the plus 10 for photos uh, that you see, that was a thing I worked on. Um, and I shipped uh, instant experiences. It was called Canvas at the time, which is Facebook's first mobile ads format. After that, went to LinkedIn, worked on Newsfeed there, um, and then a, a VP of product at a startup after that called One Signal that powers push notifications. Uh, the startup I co-founded um, is called Zing Data, and basically um, two simple realizations. One is that uh, there's way more data than there used to be, but it's hard to actually get access and do things with. Even when I was at Facebook, I remember trying to get access to Tableau and it was like manager approval and we only had a certain number of licenses and all that stuff because um, it's, it's pretty expensive every year. And then the second thing was 
um, really creating great collaborative tools around data. If we have Slack and all these other workforce tools, uh, we have Google Docs, uh, but what's the equivalent of that for data? And so um, Zing is an app, it's available in the App Store um, uh, and the Play Store to be able to visually query with just a couple taps. You can run a query from scratch, not just view a dashboard, but run a query from scratch in less than 10 seconds um, on any Postgres or MySQL data source. And you can app mention your colleagues um, and talk to them and get updates, um, kind of like Slack. Um, so mobile first, free to try, um, thinking about kind of BI from a bottoms up perspective. Um, we're say, we say we're like Tableau meets Slack built from the ground up for mobile. And we're free to try, getzingdata.com. So go, go check it out, give us feedback. You should totally uh, put your link on the chat group. I mean, everyone, please feel free to share your company, you know, website and all that. We we'll all love to, you know, share. Uh, Smendana, you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I think everyone's story is like from Facebook to being a founder. My story is the opposite. I was a founder and then I now at Facebook. Uh, I'm currently working on payments. Uh, so helping manage like uh, partner relationships uh, with banks as well as uh, payment processors like Stripe or PayPal uh, all across North America as well as globally. Uh, so that's what I do within our new org. It's called Facebook Financial. Um, before that, I founded my own startup, almost happened serendipitously. Uh, we were hacking, a, a close group of friends were really hacking on TechCrunch uh, at the Disrupt conference. And uh, we managed to get like, a front page uh, on TechCrunch with our hack, and then soon realized that um, the problem was uh, something that more people wanted solutions for. And the exact problem that we were trying to solve it around that time, two years ago, was uh, how to basically build an ad network within augmented reality. Uh, so, with the introduction of ARKit as well as AR4, we were seeing um, new apps like Pokemon Go just, uh, you know, um, uh, receiving like rocket ship growth and we were the problem we were trying to solve is like obviously the current ads the way they exist do not work in augmented reality so we need a new form of ad network that works in AR. so i primarily built uh, sorry once hello can you guys hear me yeah we can still hear you yeah. uh -oh. Uh oh, and then she disappeared. <laughs> oh no! I guess we can wait for her to uh, rejoin and then uh, just catch up on her intro. Uh, but I I noticed one thing that you know, as you guys were doing the introduction, a lot of you found the idea, you know, while working at Facebook, uh, you know, in depth. For example, like Zach and Elliot and all of you, and I think Iris and Ruben, you had a like part, like co-founder who had a business idea, and then you guys kind of you know collaborate on that. So, so you know, on the flip side, I'm I'll be curious to know like what are the things that you have to, so to say, like unlearn uh, from working at a big company like Facebook uh, as you guys are starting on this journey. I don't know who wanna go first. I'll kind of leave it up to you guys. I'll go first. Um, I think for me, the biggest thing I've had to unlearn is that there's a kind of pattern to the day of what I am going to work on today or the next day. So many things change so quickly that I don't know what I'm going to work on or what the skills I'm going to need today are. It's not like I open up the text editor and code every single day, right? I, I wake up, I see what the highest top priority is. And I work on that, but those priorities change so quickly that you can't have a preconceived, this is how every week is going to do, this is what I'm going to do today. You don't get that. Anyone found the solution for that? I think the one thing that I've sort of had to unlearn um, is distribution and getting users, right? So at Facebook, like, I was working on a new ads product, but like once we wanted a beta, we just told, you know, a couple uh, ad uh, sort of sales folks and 
you had, we had meetings at like literally the biggest advertisers within a week or two, uh, cause they were excited to try a new thing. Um, and as a startup, you're like, wait, how do we, how do we go out there and get anybody aware that we exist or to care? So even if you have something amazing, it's like, oh, well, like that's going to take time to onboard or like even the process of them learning about it. If it's not something that they know of or have proof points out there um, is, is kind of a jump for a lot of folks. Um, and you don't have like, there's not the team to like go create the marketing collateral and go do all these, uh, all these other steps. So I think I have had to unlearn the, Hey, I have a great product and I put it out there and relearn. Okay. Let's like reach out to people we know, like hit the pavement, like <laughs> that sort of motion. Yeah, maybe I'll go next that to a similar and res resonates with me a lot at Facebook. You build something, you open the gatekeeper for like 0.1% to have a million users. That's not, that just doesn't happen in the, um, in, 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 in the re re real world. Um, and I think that uh, it always kills me how, you know, like new founders are there, they're there, like not telling anybody about it. And just as Zach said, nobody cares. It would take you a, a lot of years, a lot of time until anybody even you know, would put the effort just to listen to you, let alone steal your idea and do something with it. Um, maybe the thing I would add to what, what, what you said is that I think when you end up working at something at Facebook, it's already been, you know, probably a hundred people in the organization that have been working on whatever you're working on, you know, for, for 10 years, you know, heard about it, thought about it. It's like, you almost have, and still a lot of things fail, fail a lot. Um, and in the real world, when you're alone, you're just, you know, you, don't just start building, really speak to these people, you know, find out what, what, um, what they need, make sure that someone wants to listen before you start building it. Because when you open the, the, the gate, the gates, no, nobody would come initially or, or forever. Um, so yeah, very similar at Facebook, you know, we have, we take a lot of for granted of the, you know, the users and how, 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 what we work on has been vetted by, you don't even see it, but you know, hundreds of people in the organization thought about it prioritize it, checked it, tested it before you actually go to build it, at least as an engineer. So yeah, that, that really does resonate with me and something that's, that's how to, to unlearn after you spend time at Facebook. Right. Actually, um, I feel the same that like now that we got started with this iterative, like I, we start like thinking about what is our go-to-market strategy? And that word was just like new to me, uh, never was an issue working at a big, you know, established company with like such extensive network, you know, across the globe. Um, so maybe we can, uh, I think actually, Fendana Dyard managed to dial back in. Fendana, are you there? Or not. Um, I'll, I'll ping her uh, separately and see if we can loop her back in. Uh, but maybe um, if you guys, if you guys can talk about with, you know, with all that challenges of like finding the first customers and, you know, first believers of your product, like how did you go about, you know, finding the first cohort of, um, you know, clients and customers? I know Ruben, uh, you haven't spoken on the previous one. You want to go first? I mean, okay, here we go. Like, I can just tell you the honest story. I don't have like a holistic cool like thing that is applicable for everyone. But what we did is we, so initially we, we provide transportation, right? And like, if you think about it, try to book any type of large bus right now, you have no idea where to go. And what we did is we got coasters at local bars and the coasters would say like, get there together, get there with your friends. And like, did you have to share five Ubers to get here, question mark? And it was all these little snarky comments and we left them at bars. And then we put our website because initially we we're just trying to provide the transportation. And that's how we got our first user. So it was a lot of like these college folks and like people that were just requesting party buses and shuttles. And then what we learned is like, okay, anyone that takes bigger transportation is usually part of an event. And then we're like, rather than going after the individual booker, let's go after the event organizations. And then we formed a partnership with like Coachella. 
because everyone was going to Coachella, right? Or with Amazon, because they were doing a lot of like corporate uh, transportation with wedding venues, because weddings require transportation. But initially it was coasters at bars, right? Like the little, I think they're called coasters and fortune cookies. And the fortune cookies, if you would break them open, they would have like a nice little funny comment um, in them. So that's how we got our, our first customers. And then obviously before that, it was like friends and family, right? Like that's the, that's the first 10. And then it was coasters and fortune cookies. Did you go to the bars and ask them to use your coaster? Like, I'm just curious on the logistics or Chinese restaurants. And you're like, we will give you free fortune cookies if you use our fortune cookie. Like what was the, I mean, we're going raw now, but we just put them on the tables. Like, no, we didn't ask for any permission from like bar owners. We would just like go and like just leave them there and then people would put their drinks on them. So that was like the first strategy. So yeah, I found some fortune cookies the other day and I was like, okay, this is like a weird strategy. So, so Ruben, I'm curious because you have to bring the, the riders, I guess, but then you need to, you have to bring the, I guess, supply side. How, how does it work on the other side of the marketplace, if I understand it correctly? That's exactly it, right? We need both sides, typical like marketplace dynamics. We just, the good thing for us is we're not supply side constrained. If you call like on the supply side, if you call someone and you're like, hey, I have a ride for you tonight at 8 p.m. and you can make $300, they're not gonna turn it down, right? Like the proposition that you have is very attractive because you come with a mm -hmm. ride. It's like, if you go to a restaurant and you say, hey, I have a catering order for a thousand dollars tonight, do you wanna do it? Every restaurant's gonna be like, yep, you got it. So in a way, that was a very easy sell on the supply side. Mm -hmm. um, and the supply side is very accustomed to getting uh, trips from other operators in the world. So they're very used to like us just calling them and like saying, hey, um, uh, yeah, like do a ride with us. Mm -hmm. Got it, makes sense. I would say I cheated. Yeah. I stayed in the same industry. My industry is the target enter enterprise engineers. I have been an enterprise engineer. I cheated, right? Like I, I saved my target market. I'm targeting to people that look and act kind of similar to me. Um, so the network that I built kind of to get a job is the same network that I can then use to um, go try and get the first intros to the sales managers, that kind of thing. The difference is you have to learn to hustle. You, you do have to learn to continually keep emailing and say, I've got something that I can help you with or how can I do this or what do you need? You can't just say like, here's the standard procedure that everyone follows. You've got to keep hustling. Right, uh, Zach, how, how did you go about that? Like, I know you launched on product hunt and all that. Yeah. Um, so I always like love data and stat I was a stats major at Berkeley Gobert's uh, and, you know, worked in a bunch of places where I use data and companies would pay us a bunch of like consulting firms and stuff. But what I realized was like so many people at a company like didn't have that level of facility with like SQL or even Excel. And so all these companies were like, we want to make database decisions. And even a company like Facebook that's big and rich and has a lot of data scientists, like even as a PM, I was always like, can we get like half of the data scientists to help on this, right? It was like always hard to, to, to really make data available as broadly as, as I knew I wanted it to be. And then I saw that when I was a head of product at a startup and like we had like two people who could run queries who weren't engineers. And so we just were really slow at using data to make decisions and I looked out there at what was out there and was like, we, we could do better than this. And like all this stuff is like single player. We should make this like collaborative, like what Robinhood did for stock trading, we should do for, um, for, for data. And so it was kind of born out of very similar to Elliot. It was like a thing I wanted and would have made my life a lot easier. Um, and then from there, I was like, am I just crazy or are other people also having this itch? And then I went out and talked to about 20 folks, friends of mine, warm connections, friendlies, you know, fellow alums of universities and stuff. And that's where it got really crisp. So I talked to a guy who ended up um, business intelligence at a, at a public company. And he said, 40 to 50% of my team's time is spent like making super simple graphs or doing super simple queries. That's a waste of my team's time. And I was like, ooh, okay, data scientists are expensive. 50% of something expensive is still expensive. 
there's value there if I can build a product that that meets that need and makes it makes it easier for individuals to query stuff without needing like data scientists involved. So, but validate word to the wise. Uh -huh. Even right. even if it's like you have this problem and you want a thing that solves this problem for you, like sanity check that it's not just you. Right. So I, I guess like from the valid, I think there's a subtle difference between the, the validation uh, and like actually getting people to use, um, especially if you're a B2C, uh, you know, business. Uh, Zach, did you get any luck on like actually having companies like use the product that you built and how yeah. you approached it? So, so we figured this out, which was the bigger companies who actually would be like the biggest ACVs and stuff like that were actually not the right first customer for us because they need like infosec stuff. They need all the security stuff. They want uh, SOC 2 compliance. They need all this stuff that's like a pain and slow and somewhat expensive to do. And so we figured out like the right person, the right buyer is someone who's, you know, 20 to 200 employees. It's not the big company, even if you have a relationship there, it's someone who can like just use a tool, take a risk and you can give it to them for free, get them using it, liking it. And then, you know, over time you make money or whatever. But. Nice. There's, also an additional, there's an additional trap there. I think Zach, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but if you start with these big companies, sometimes you also waste a lot of time going through the motions because the ACV, the average contract value is so high. Right, so now, oh, like, cool, this is like a $1.8 million opportunity. This would be enough if we can just close them. And now you go through all of these motions to try to close them, but you're, it's like an opportunity cost, right? Because what are you not doing at this time? And I think that's another thing you have to be cautious of. There is a playbook for startups to sell to large companies. It's not a net negative, but you have to be, you have to treat that very cautiously in my opinion. I think, Iris, you might want to add your take there because you're dealing with a government, which is a whole different beast. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Well, I actually think the only thing crazier than saying to the government is, is actually doing B2C for me. It's like, you know, how do you get people to magically come to your product? The thing I like about B2B or B2G is that, you know, the way to get customers is to talk to them until you can get to the person and talk and see that they respond to your problem and then they get excited about your idea and then mock-ups and then what you actually, you know, demo, whatever you built. Um, you know, until you can do that, you know, that's how you will, be, you will be bringing customers. So what I like about B2B and that's what we did at the beginning and, and still until today is find a way to get to these people, talk to them, talk to them a lot, even if you don't know what to ask, just, you know, understand them, especially if you're doing something that is not like some of the folks here to just their own problem, which I agree, it's a big advantage if you can find a problem like that. Um, but yeah, in B2B, I think until someone gives you, you know, a paper with your signature with, you know, with money involved, that's then, you know, that's that's how you get the customers. And yeah, just talk to them a lot until you 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 find that thing. And that's 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 what we did. Interestingly, we also started with bigger governments, which was definitely a mistake. We built something that was only relevant for them and very hard to sell to them. And now with kind of our pivot, we're targeting kind of the smallest governments that we can, and that's that's for us much 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 better. Um, so I would uh, second that point of being super careful with big customers early on. Yeah, 